these planes epitomize the shape of the supersonic jet fighter. They were the Century Fighters. After the close of the Second World War, there was a period of great expansion in jet engine development. The release of German design data spurred on the second generation of jet fighter aircraft. In particular, the concepts in swept wing designs. Previously, jet aircraft designs had maintained the straight wing concepts of their propeller driven forebears. These had also brought with them the speed and maneuverability limitations associated with wings designed for slower existing speeds. World affairs at the time were also turning frosty between the Soviet and American governments. The worsening dialogue between the nations saw the world marching towards the Cold War period. World paranoia was raised another notch in 1949, when the Soviets displayed reverse-engineered B-29 fortresses as their TU-4 long-range bombers. Having previously tested their own nuclear weapons, American defense analysts were forced to rethink their Air Force requirements. The American fighter inventory at the time had the North American-built F-86 Sabre. This was a very technically advanced fighter for its day. The 35-degree swept wing, exceptional view and hydraulic control surfaces made this a favorite of many fighter pilots. To counter the threat of the Soviet long-range bombers, the F-86s were designed as interception fighters and armed with a cluster of six half-inch machine guns in the nose of the plane and a rack of unguided rockets mounted under the fuselage. A favorite at air shows was the sonic boom produced by the planes to impress the crowds. These fighters were publicly seen to be the plane of the future and as the cutting edge of American Air Force. The middle of 1950 saw a new battleground in the skies above Korea. Originally, the Sabres were to be used as bomber escorts for the B-29s, destroying the North Korean infrastructure. On the 1st of November, though, Russian MiG-15 stunned the American pilots with their performance. These aircraft were much further advanced than the American concepts of Russian jet development. The B-29s, even with their defensive armament, were no match for the outstanding needs. The Sabres were then sent to defend the bombers and so began the fighter versus fighter combat that would become the MiG and Sabre discussion that still rages today. One of the primary advantages of the MiG over the Sabre was its 50,000 foot service ceiling, 10,000 feet above that of the F-86s. There was nothing that the Sabre pilots could do unless the MiGs decided to come down and do battle. However, one of the most serious weaknesses of the MiG-15 was its tendency to go into uncontrollable spins, especially in the hands of inexperienced pilots. Many Sabre victories in Korea were schooled without the F-86 pilots ever having to fire their guns. They merely forced their MiG opponents into spins from which their pilots could not recover. By the end of the conflict, the facts that had proven most decisive were that, as the U.S. Air Force had no clear air superiority at that time, it was U.S. pilots and crews, who were all highly trained and experienced airmen, that made the difference, whereas with the exception of some Russian World War II veterans, the MiG pilots were often sent into combat with only limited training and flying experience. The F-86 models were phased out of the Air Force inventory within a year after the Korean War. However, five new fighters were then in research and development phases. They were popularly called the Century Series due to their 100-plus designations. Three of these aircraft, the F-100, the F-101 and the YF-102, were descended from existing fighter designs. The remaining two 
the F-103 and the F-104 were entirely new concepts. The Air Force considered the F-100 Sabre, later called a Super Sabre, to be an improvement of the latest F-86 design and ordered it for immediate production. The F-100 was more than an updated F-86, however. The new aircraft incorporated a 45-degree angle swept wing, a larger fuselage, new armament and a new engine, the J-57 P-7 Patton Whitney turbojet, complete with afterburner. North American Aviation completed much of the design on its own. The Air Force ordered production models of the aircraft in 1952, skipping the usual prototype testing phase. The first flight of the YF-100A took place on 25th of May 1953, with no major deficiencies noted. By mid-year, however, three problems became apparent. Low speed handling characteristics, poor visibility over the nose during takeoff and landing, and inadequate static and dynamic stability. Two of the problems were quickly rectified, but the issue of low speed handling, particularly on landings and takeoff, was to dog the Super Sabre throughout its life. The F-100 went on to become a specialist ground attack fighter bomber and was used in extensive deployment during the Vietnam conflict and the Rolling Thunder program. The F-101 Voodoo for McDonnell was a swept-wing twin-engine jet fighter. Like the F-100, the F-101 also used the J-57 engines, four 20mm T-160 cannon and built-in air refueling equipment. The new aircraft, planned to replace the F-84, made its first flight in the fall of 1954 and entered service in 1957. In addition to its role as bomber escort, the aircraft had strategic striking and air-to-air -air combat capabilities. The Air Force also adapted the aircraft for reconnaissance missions. Convair F-102A Delta Dagger single-seat all-weather interceptor was the first delta-wing combat aircraft in the world to enter operational service. It was also the world's first all-weather interceptor capable of supersonic performance in level flight. It was the first fighter to have an all-missile armament provided as standard from the very start of the initial design stage. The YF-103 was an even more high-performance interceptor being developed by Republic Aviation at the same time as the F-102. However, in 1954, funds were denied for an extended development program, and in 1957, the program was cancelled altogether. Development of the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, an advanced day fighter scheduled to replace the F-100, began in 1952 but didn't make significant progress until mid-1954. This aircraft, called a minimum concept weapon, was meant to perform air superiority missions at lower expense than its more complex contemporaries. The F-104 had a thin straight wing attached to a long, slender fuselage and was able to reach a top speed of Mach 1.83. Although the aircraft made its first flight in 1956, it didn't enter operational service until two years later. Later designs went to the outstanding F-105 Thunder Chief, F-106 Delta Dart, a further development of Convair's Delta Dagger, and then onto the F-107 for North America. All of the aircraft in the series had their initial problems. Most were dealt with in further development, but some became part and parcel of the job description of jet fighter pilot. 
With the speeds now being achieved by the planes, the concept of landing became somewhat of an exercise in controlled chaos. The landing difficulties, which were experienced by the pilots, also extended to having a very long roll session if the deceleration sheet failed on the tarmac. Of the most worrisome, though, was still the lack of low-speed maneuverability characteristics of the plane on landing. Here, the pilot has seen he's undershooting his landing point and attempts to pull his plane up. In opening the throttle too quickly, he's induced compressor stall and the plane has sunk below a controllable speed. The resulting overcorrections have only compounded the problem and the final result was catastrophic. At times, this problem became common enough for it to be given the term Sabre Dance. Though this became the bane of many of the Century Fighters, it was not in particular a design flaw as such. It was only that the airframes were designed with one purpose, and that was to go fast. The design requirements for supersonic speeds are not at all forgiving at slow speeds. As a result, no landing was ever to be taken for granted in a Century Fighter. Many of the aircraft were further developed after their initial acceptance. The 104 from Lockheed was initially designed as an interception and air superiority fighter. It was occasionally described as a manned missile and almost supported the fact as the tiny wings were bolted onto the outside skin of the aircraft. The Starfighter was also one of the very unforgiving styles of Century Fighter. The German Luftwaffe lost over 200 planes in accidents. For a significant period, the 104 itself was widely regarded as the hottest plane in the air. In spite of its initial testing problems with in-flight pitch-up, it went on to set and hold most records in speed, height and climb at one time. Even when the F-4 Phantom II broke the Starfighter's records, the 104 reset them outside the F-4's abilities. Further developments of the airframe were later required to meet customer demands. The in-flight refueling concept, taken for granted today, had to be invented for the Century Series. Significant retrofitting, though, was required for the 104 to be able to successfully deliver the unguided Genie nuclear rocket. With the plane's fuselage fully occupied with its engine, some concerns of how to provide separation before firing led to an elaborate trapeze concept for launching the weapon. Testing showed the 104 easily coped with all the new requirements though it still failed to generate any large U.S. orders. The Genie missile was powered by a Thiokol Tu-389 rocket motor and was unguided, relying on its 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead to ensure a kill. Launch weight was 822 pounds and maximum velocity was Mark 3.3. Snap-out fins gave the missile stability during flight. Range was about 8 miles, and flight time to target was about 12 seconds. One of the most significant marks of Lockheed's 104 was, though it didn't achieve major domestic sales in the US, its production did run for over 30 years for various NATO air forces and stayed in service even longer. On June 11, 1954, the U.S. Air Force authorized to contract North American's next fighter project, the F-100B fighter bomber. On July 8, 
the Air Force notified North American that the designation for the project had been officially changed to F-107A. Since this aircraft was so vastly different from the original F-100A, it deserved a completely new fighter designation. In comparison with the original F-100 with a top speed of around Mach 1.25, the F-107 was 50% longer and could achieve closer to Mach 2 as an interceptor. Also, moving the engine intake from the nose to the top of the fuselage just behind the cockpit allowed the conformal storage inside the fuselage of various nuclear weapons. The first F-107A took off on its maiden flight on September 10, 1956 at Edwards Air Force Base, with North American's test pilot Bob Baker at the controls. It went supersonic on its first flight, although there was some minor damage upon landing when the drag chute malfunctioned and the aircraft overran the end of the concrete runway and ended up in a ditch. The aircraft was quickly repaired and flew again three days later. The F-107A found itself in direct competition with the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief for production orders. In March 1957, the US Air Force decided to go with the F-105 and the F-107 was relegated to aerodynamic testing duties. The North American F-107 is widely regarded today as one of the best planes never to go into service. The F-105 Thunder Chief was the first supersonic tactical fighter bomber that was developed from scratch for this role. All others before it were adaptations of aircraft that had originally been developed as pure fighters. The Thunder Chief has the distinction of being the largest single-seat single-engine fighter ever built. Although designed for the nuclear strike role, the Thunder Chief gained distinction for the role it played in the Vietnam War in delivering conventional ordnance on targets in the North. The first YF-105A rolled out of the factory in the autumn of 1955. It was shipped to Edwards Air Force Base for initial trials over the Mojave Desert. The first flight of the YF-105A took place on October 22, 1955. It easily exceeded the speed of sound on its first flight, although, as expected, the transonic drag was quite high. It was the largest and heaviest single-seat fighter ever built up to that time. On January 30, 1957, the YF-105B, equipped with the new Patton Whitney J-75 turbojet engine, took off on its first flight. The maximum speed reached during tests was Mach 2.15, which was remarkable considering the weight of the plane. Interestingly, the Convair F-106A was to use the same Patton Whitney J-75 engine as the Thunder Chief though later developments saw it fitted with an even more powerful version of the J-75. In mid-1957, the F-106A was given the popular name Delta Dart and went on to be regarded by many as being the finest all-weather interceptor ever built. It served on active duty with the US Air Force for almost 28 years, much longer than most of its contemporaries. Despite the Thunder Chief's large size and weight, in May of 1963, the F-105B was selected to replace the F-100C Super Sabres of the Thunderbirds flight demonstration team. The Thunderbirds team flew a few demonstrations with their F-105Bs, but a serious accident occurred in May. The modifications directed as a result of this accident prevented the use of the F-105Bs in any more public airshows. Because of its heavy schedule, the Thunderbirds team was hastily re-equipped with eight F-100D Super Sabres. Here, 
here the Thunderbirds are putting their hums through one of the display sequences they'd become so well known for. The F-100Ds we made with the Thunderbirds until 1969. Though many of the Century series of fighter aircraft had their inherent flaws, all of them played extraordinary roles in the development of today's aeronautic technology. They had truly made their marks as the Century Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> 